Welcome. Technology. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, for those of you who do know do not know Back for some reason, uh, Back is an amazing uh, design, creative, art, and technology agency with offices around the world. And Ben is a global creative uh, director. And let me show you some of their work because it is fantastic. Seriously, it's a uh, uh, one of the most um, visual and uh, visually enriching uh, companies that I've, I've ever seen. So uh, they've done work for Nike, Google, and my personal favorite is the Tinder campaign, mm -hmm. which are, literally I could watch and repeat. It's just the cutest thing in the world, uh, as well as our BBC too. We love BBC and uh, uh, we know that CP Union did their great rebrand and uh, you've been doing the fantastic animations and the creativity behind it, which is amazing. And from the recent, from your work, you've been rebranding yourself, which is one of the most challenging jobs for any oh, creative agency. Uh, so it's quite uh, a creative process that you had there. And we'll talk more about uh, what you've done and how it all came about. But um, Ben, uh, let's start with uh, the very beginning. Could you tell... Mm -hmm everyone a bit more about yourself and how did you end up doing creative stuff as well as working for Buck? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hello world. Um, I, you know, my name's Ben Langsfeld. I'm a group creative director here in the New York office, but we are very much a global company at this point. Um, but it started, you know, back in the 90s, I guess, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, I was at Penn, I was there with a friend of mine, Thomas Schmidt, who's also a group creative director at the New York office. And we, uh, you know, I was studying fine art and business and communication. So I wasn't, there was no industry yet. There was no animation field yet. So I was learning all of the things I could piece together to sort of solve that problem and solve, you know, solve that interest. And I, I got to a point where you know, it was really just about being in the labs, you know, being on the box, teaching myself software, teaching myself how to do everything. And uh, I found, you know, a friend in that Thomas who we used to do it together. We'd always find ourselves late in the computer labs, just jamming away on our own projects. And we decided to do some together. And then we actually formed our own company called Anyone back in the early 2000s. And we did uh, everything from like websites to uh, album art to, you know, clothing to we did you know kind of everything um at the time and we would get uh contracted by ryan honey uh when he was at heavy at the time and orion as well they were both there and we would do you know websites illustrations for them uh you know just little odds and ends jobs but it was always very easy to work with them and we we noticed that and when they started you know soon after we were working with them there they started buck out of la and they would ask us to make some story, you know, style frames or character designs. And we would be like, sure. So we did it and it was awesome. So we kept doing it and they offered us a retainer and sort of the rest was history. So we were in Philadelphia at the time and we, you know, we, we, there were some other studios that we were, had our eyes on at the time, but we saw Buck is in this unique position where we were really small. They were really small at the time. We were really small at the time. And there was like 10 of us, uh, at, you know, and, now we're almost a you know approaching 300 and with three offices worldwide so it was a definitely a whirlwind ride wow that is from going from 10 to 300 that's quite a journey and you've yeah. been now there 16 years is that something yeah 15 16 years 15, yeah yeah mm -hmm. great so you've probably seen how the agency developed and kind of how the industry changed as well so what was this 16 year journey? And I suppose what was Buck 16 years ago? Was it supposed to be the creative agency or was it supposed to be something else? And how did it develop to what it is now? Uh, I mean, a little of both. It, it was kind of, I, I feel like we were always sort of meant to do what we're doing, but at the same time, it was very different. You know, the, the tasks were smaller. It was like network packages, rebrands, uh, little commercials and tags, you know, a very a, a wide range of, of things we would do, but mostly in the design and animation space. And, you know, I always think of them as like, uh, they're sort of like between a generation and like a cycle, you know, like things happen, there's turnover, there's new people come and go, there's new creative trends happening. There's, uh, you know, new ads like cell animation is hot right now. 3D design is hot right now. Cells not as much, you know, so 
you know, there's, we definitely flex in different directions. And so part of our, our goal is to just be extremely diverse and agnostic about the creative process so that we're not like pigeonholed into one bucket. We are kind of in lots of different buckets. So, um, you know, seeing it evolve and grow, it was, you know, truly magical. There's definitely a lot of pain points along the way, but there was also some, some big wins. And, you know, we, I think you can always look at like certain jobs that like projects that go out into the world and they sort of set the tone for, for the period of time after that. And you start to see more, more, more interest in that kind of work. Um, and uh, what's funny about that is that a lot of the projects that did that for us were ones that we, you know, personally invested in. So I think that's where I came back to, like, it was sort of always meant to be this way because we would, we would invest in sort of what we wanted to the future to look like. And we would sort of just, you know, execute really at a high level the stuff that's, you know, that, that, that keeps the doors open and keeps us going. But, you know, we really just try to put our, our efforts in the places where we really want to, you know, be continuing to work. Right. And you mentioned the creative process that uh, evolved and changed and kind of now is uh, probably a very good creative process considering you have 300 uh, people working for you. That means uh, you need to kind of perfect it to the point where everyone can align with it. So what mm -hmm. uh, is your typical process when, let's say, a company like Google approaches you and say, yay, we have a new product, we want a cool thing and do they come to you with a specific style do they come to you with mm -hmm. a specific idea how do you go from there to creating the final piece there's a there's a range um i think that's really where things have evolved the most in the last few years is that we used to get a brief and be like here's some reference here's a brief here's a script and we're like okay we'll do it um but more so now uh we're getting challenged with like very different things where there's no brief that's really an open creative uh, opportunity and it's for it's on us to sort of help define that with our partners so uh, sometimes we'll get um, we've got a new product it's got a launch uh, it, it's going to compete with these people what do we do and so we we do a little bit of an audit some development some brand strategy and we come back with a brief and we sort of define you know what our guardrails are and what our, our opportunity to, to succeed is there and, and help them in that partnership. So we are very much leaning into partnerships in that direction, but we also still receive a brief. So, you know, a lot of incoming comes in through us and from all different directions. And we, even from our other offices, we all kind of share the load. We're very much, you know, as best as we possibly can being uh, global minded about our resources and our, our talent. And, so it usually comes in through a few lanes and we take a look at it and we, you know, start to define who the best people are for that creative. And we, we like to think that at our scale, we're able to draw like big circles around big projects and big asks, ambitious asks. And we're also able to small, draw small circles around something that just needs to get done quickly and efficiently and look beautiful. So that ability to flex really, you know, allows us the, the ability to, to push in different directions in, yeah, at the same time. Uh, but we usually, you know, we, like like everything, we make sure that there's a creative lead on every project and that they're supported with uh, an art director or someone with like a really clear vision as to what it should look like. And then we have this, you know, we call it the Buck Massive. We just have like this uh, amazing pool of talent that we get to tap into and and really put them in, in the position to succeed. And that's really our, our main goal is to sort of give our artists the, the, the opportunity to succeed and, and create something beautiful. That makes sense. And um, in terms of the, the length of this process, because I think, as you mentioned, some of the projects are very straightforward and some can, can last for, for a very long time. What's your typical length of uh, working on something like, let's say, uh, a Google brief where you, kind of the, you created the new product uh, visuals and, and everything that went with it? Yeah, the, the new product stuff, the stuff that involves... Uh you know, often we're like the spoke of a, a wheel, like we're the, the center hub and we're working with different agencies and the brand directly and we're working with artists all over the world. And so those projects, those bigger orchestration projects are much bigger and longer uh, just because there's just a lot of uh, infrastructure that goes into them. But there's also this lean nimble ones that could be, you know, a couple weeks, two, three weeks and we can bang something out. We've had some ridiculous apps recently that are like, you know, one week sprints and, and we're, we don't love those, but we can do them. And we, uh, but, you know, 
I think the typical process for the, one of those longer ones is a, is like two two to three months. Okay. And, and uh, that's very interesting what you mentioned about very quick projects and um, what you said before that you sometimes have the kind of the, the styles and the kind of the the basis uh, for for something to do to do quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is another side of that coin: how not to fall fall into this trap all the time when you know you already have kind of a very clear visual, you already have half of the work done, and you can sell mm -hmm. it again and again just because it looks beautiful. Why not? Uh, so how do you stop yourself, and how do you stop clients from asking, "Can you please asking, do the yeah. same the, 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 as, as BBC or something like that?" Totally. It happens all the time. And, and I feel like it's really been one of the, the hardest challenges for us is to continually, continually reinvent ourselves. And, and I think it, it has to do with us being a little bit ADD or like, a, you know, we're, we really don't like to do the same thing twice. Like, I don't even like what I did last year or last <laughs> week, you know, so we're always kind of trying to push something, some envelope, we're always trying to find a new way to solve something. So it's really never about, um, oh, we can do that style or this style. It's it's like, what's the, I like to talk about it as like the job is the boss most of the time, like the, and we have to do right by the job. Uh, so it, it, you know, in being style agnostic, we really like to think of ourselves as, you know, there's, it's idea first and it's concept first. It's very, everything's rooted there and the idea and then the execution is purely a expression of that. That's great. And I think it's so important to have that process of understanding the strategy and what the brand stands for and not dive straight into the visuals, which yeah. a lot of clients, I assume, um, just want to go straight into there. But having that conversation that everything starts with proper understanding what you stand for, I think it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. One of the big ones is, I suppose, the future of uh, design and design jobs and where it's all going. Because again, you've been in the industry for 16 years and you've seen things uh, changing from um, kind of one screen and one format to being social, uh, to kind of going from TV commercials to very digital, various medias to AR and lots of industries and fields that didn't exist before. Um, what would you recommend uh, to someone who is um, kind of interested in that type of work, motion, animation, graphics, creativity, visual things, um, but is afraid to go into the field that will be outdated very soon? How do you stay, how do you develop yourself and what would you say is the future of that, at least for the next five years? Yeah, I think uh, for the next five years, you know, screens are just going to become more of a thing. And I think you can even see this happening now very rapidly where, we, you know, we're all, you know, stuck at home and we're working from our screens and, and everywhere we look, there's content. And so we're, we like to think of this as like peak content era. And that content can take any form. And so for us, it's really just about not, uh, you know, being so specific and so specialized about one direction or one screen type and it's making sure that you know we're committed to all screen types and we really think that the future all of that's going to go away the idea of uh, a six second deliverable or a 30 second or an ar deliverable that's all going to evaporate and it's just going to be content and so we uh, our, uh, my recommendation would really be to learn everything you can and everything that piques your interest to learn it and study it and make it a tool in your toolkit so that when you get asked uh, to, to really dig into a creative challenge, you're thinking about it conceptually. You're not using your tool to come up with the idea. You're using your, your brain and you're coming up with, you know, concepts, thoughts, meaningful connections between humans and, and making sure that you have the tools in your back pocket to actually execute it in whichever medium uh, is the most, you know, rich for that. Great. Uh, yeah, and totally. I think the technology uh, always changes, but um, the ideas and the, the thinking behind it, I think that's what the most important thing for any creative person. So totally agree with you to follow the ideas. Um, a question from Critical Tree. Uh, thank you for being here. How do you feel about bringing AR and mixed reality into animation and branding projects? We love it. We think it's just another expression of, uh, you know, what's possible. So, you know, we've done a lot of treatments and, and pitches and executions where it's really about what, what if, you know, and I think that's a, 
a really great way to think about uh, all of this is like, what if we did that? What if we did this? And just asking those questions, those curiosities about where it could go and, and what it could be. I think we're still at this point where we're trying to define its place in our lives and, and, and where it belongs and how, how we can uh, better it and, and, and how it could better our lives. So I'm not sure we have the answer yet. I'm not sure if we will sometime in the, in the near future, but I think that the, the idea that it's just becoming part of our DNA and our, our fabric and, it's what's it's part of the reason we're so connected. I think that's a a really strong, you know, uh, advocate for it as a medium because it's already doing it. You know, it's already working in that way. Have you seen any good examples of uh, mixed uh, reality or AR used for brands or for creative campaigns? You know, the stuff that we've been playing with are just extensions of like, uh, you know the brand itself and and you know when you're when you're you know interacting with that brand and you just have another opportunity to to connect with them that way like you know bring things to life in a certain way or um you know i can't think of any examples offhand but i just do think that you know it should be thought of as a uh not a deliverable but just an extension of of the the situation of the experience great um we have so many questions like guys you have the best fans in the world i think <laughs> everyone wants to know what happens behind the scenes so, the magic sure yeah and everyone loves your work same as us so that's great um so let's go through a couple more questions um so jesu win uh, is asking about creative process but we discussed it a little bit but uh, they also asking how do you do brainstorm i think just in general how do you come up with ideas where do you get inspiration from uh i would say the most part it it's not that much, it's not rocket science it's it's ourselves you know it's it's like the it's it's our minds it's our it's each other i think you know you know we really think about this ability to inspire people and and that starts with inspiring each other and i think we really lean on each other and we trust each other to uh to to come up with that good idea to be that that better voice in the room um but, you know, I, I would say more literally, uh, we usually have these like discovery phases in the beginning of jobs where it involves R&D or it involves just blue sky exploratory. We, we pull a lot of reference. We get together on a round table or a Zoom and we just, you know, talk about what the challenge is. We talk about the, you know, not about like what our interests are necessarily, but what, what the challenge really is and trying to really get the clearest description of what the challenge really is at, at its core and then finding out a way to take that and spin it a little bit and then use that as the the basis of an idea and from there comes traditional storyboarding concept art um illustration uh you know people some of our people their tool is 3d so they go and they explore in there and they start sculpting or lighting rendering whatever it is like it's really just sketching uh in in any way that you feel is important whether it's written or in tangible and i think that it's you know what we like to do is think of it as a there's no one that's saying this is my idea and we're all going to do this idea it's really let's talk about the ideas let's bubble them up it's very synergistic in that sense where we think of these small little teams as the, the you know a a brain trust for the the concept and they really lean on each other and there's we're very candid we're very open we're not uh there's really we check our egos at the door and we're super collaborative. So we're really trying to just get to that idea of the, it's sometimes it's messy. Some people don't like it. It's not for everybody. Everyone kind of likes what, wait, what do you want me to do? And for a lot of people, that's, that's a challenge, but I think that the best ideas do come out of it. I love it. And definitely you can see how great your culture is. Everyone I've heard from they have a work for Buck. Uh, everyone says that it's like a truly inspiring place and truly safe space for creativity. So you're definitely doing a good job on having that culture where everyone is heard and everyone can put any idea out. And I think that shows in your work. So that's really great. Um, Thank you couple of uh, more questions. Tess Martin is asking, uh, when you get the crazy asks, for example, one week sprints, have you found any responses or tactics uh, that have been helpful in dealing with this? <laughs> um, people are going to kill me that I said that we did that. Um, we, 
it's hard. It's you know we're we're really just trying to be be good partners, be be good at um, problem solving, and sometimes that means scratching an itch, and sometimes it's about like proving to ourselves that we can do things again and that we can be small and lean. There, there's a lot of uh, you know in terms of pushback, it, it's really just that you know the classic like quick, fast, and, you know, good, you know, the, the, the model of three things, but two, you know, it's probably, there's probably more to it now than that. And we have a long list of things that we do when we assess new, new opportunities, but it really just comes down to the, to the creative opportunity. And if it seems like one that's, that's fruitful from either a creative standpoint or, or sometimes a financial standpoint, we'll, we'll take that risk. But, you know, for us, it's really just about gauging burnout and making sure that our artists are like, thriving and so you know those kinds of things are definitely not things we like and are 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 passionate about but sometimes they're they're necessary and sometimes they're kind of fun at the same time uh strangely but i i think a lot you know a lot of times you have these long timelines and they can be a, a drag and a slog and so you want to make sure that you're 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 striking that balance between you know, I, when i was coming up and you know we, we got asked to work on a couple of feature films and uh, you know, me and Thomas personally, and we were kind of just like, I don't know how I would work on the same job for eight months. And since then, I've actually worked on a few jobs for eight months. And it's hard. It's like, by by month three, you're kind of you're fatigued, no matter what you're doing. And it, it just takes that little bit of extra effort to recommit creatively and, and, you know, with purpose and making sure that, again, the job's the boss, and it, it definitely needs your attention. So you have to give it the care it deserves. Actually, on that point, do you have any uh, small tips or anything when you get bored of, of a project? What do you do to kind of refresh the excitement? And Yeah, it, it's, it's tricky. Like I, 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 I directed with a few different kinds, a few different people, um, all of the Sherwin-Williams spots that we've done. And that was a, a project we constantly had to reinvent ourselves because it was something we did like in the high teen, like 19 versions of it or something. And it's, it gets to the point where people are like, oh my God, more paint chips. But we always try to find a new way in. And I think that that's, that's the, you know, taking that step back and being able to look at the work for what it is and not take it so personally, you're able to look at it and find a new challenge or a new curiosity in it that helps you get there and, or, or at least recommit to getting there. And, so, you know, we really leaned into character. Sometimes we really leaned into behavior. Other times we were like, we want to do more like portraiture. Another time we were like, let's animate thousands of cards at a time. And, and that's going to be the challenge this time. So you really have to get the team excited with a new challenge. Even if it's just words, um, it, it helps people feel like they're, they're chasing something, not just chasing their tail. Brilliant. I think that's such a good advice about finding a challenge in, in kind of an everyday work. I can relate to, uh, to that from a, a gym perspective. I I love exercising, mm -hmm. but if I'm not challenged, I get bored so quickly. So just kind of constantly going and doing exercise or like doing the same thing every day, I just would not survive. So it's always like finding, oh, today I'll try to learn this. I'll try doing this. So I'll challenge myself to do something new and different. And that way, kind of, you keep yourself engaged and excited, even when kind of your normal motivation is down. And I think, yeah, in design mm -hmm. work, it's even more important to find those little challenges throughout your career as well as throughout the project to yeah. get yourself excited about the work that you do. It's a it's a marathon, and it, and you know, if you sprint too fast at any given moment, you're gonna a mile two, you're gonna be on the ground. So you really have to think about it as like a holistic approach, the way you would life, the way you would, you know, meditation, yoga, or exercise, you know, it's like, it, it's the long game that you have to really be mindful of. So, you know, sprinting around as fast as you can, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt a little bit. Definitely. Uh, we have lots of questions about remote work. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, what's FAC stands on remote work? Uh, from, from in, formation art is asking, does that happen a lot, especially given the recent change in the work climate? And similar question from uh, Prechi MD, does your team work remotely or is Buck a typical brick and mortar studio? I think it's, a, it's both, obviously. Um, it's, yes, we are brick and mortars. We're very passionate about our culture and about our teams and the FaceTime is, is you know, 
so important the 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 connection that you get the you know we talk about this uh, this voyeurism that you get when you're in our studio where you're able to sort of sneak around and look at people's monitors and it's so inspiring to this you know the people to the left and the people to the right you're just your minds are blown every day so we do feel like there is something there to champion and that there always will be a place for uh a an internal like a, a brick and mortar existence but you know this transition that we had to recently make, you know, going from three offices to 300 offices, what happened very naturally because we do do a lot of this, you know, we do work a lot with freelancers all over the world with, uh, you know, with, with talent in, it doesn't really matter where they are. As long as the time zones kind of match up, you know, since we do have our Sydney studio, we're constantly juggling, you know, times where we can all meet and talk. So it's a it's a bit of a, a a scheduling challenge, but you know we figured out ways to remote work uh, through different services very fluidly, and we've been doing it for years. So this new existence really hasn't changed much. It's really just making us really push on it and try to create new things. I think we've done a really good job at like recreating our our existence in the brick and mortar in in remote. But now I think we're we're our new project is thinking of ways where we can take the the the, the non-integrated sort of system and, and, and move a little farther and see how far we can push it into, into remote work. So I think it's just a good opportunity. And I think it does ladder up to a lot of the stuff that we believe in terms of, uh, you know, finding the best talent in the world. And if they can't be in our, the places that we exist, then we can still have, you know, opportunities for them to, to help and support us. Oh, absolutely. And actually on the note of the talent, uh, yes, pre yes. Oh, I, I'm very bad at pronouncing the nicknames, but uh, one mm -hmm. of the people who loves your work, uh, let me try it again, Yaspriya Sahme uh, is asking, what qualities do you look uh, at in designers when you are hiring? Oh, cool. That's a great question. And I think that it's a constantly evolving answer, but I think that the, the core of it is that they're, they are, are, we like to think of ourselves as, as really mostly generalists so we do a lot of things we all wear a lot of hats and the people that are generalists tend to do the best uh, you know career wise here um that's not to say we don't have a ton of specialists who are in constant demand but i i feel like that's not the only thing that we're ever looking for we're looking for like being able to think being able to write being able to design illustrate and i think the more places you can you know we're very much like a a team or a, you know, like all, you know, on a ship together where we find a leak, we fill it. We kind of all kind of try to, to fill all the shoes and play all the roles. So the more you can learn, the better. And I think when we look at portfolios specifically, we're not looking for like, oh, that person can do this style perfectly. We're looking for someone who can, one, do things that are, you know, unique and have a very good th good thinking behind it. There's more of an idea or a concept behind the work. Um, a high level of consistency we're also looking. We're also looking for uh, collaboration is a big thing. So, you know, sitting in your room and making lots of stuff and having this awesome portfolio doesn't necessarily mean you'll translate to a culture where you've got a lot of fingerprints on everything. So, you, you you know, I, I would recommend working with other members in your community or, or, you know, people you follow, like reaching out, collaborating. And I think that the thoughtfulness of those collaborations catch a lot of attention. And they also just speak to this ability to work in a team. So I think that's just like a, a very big thing that I think people might miss. They're thinking of like me, me, me. But I think when we look at people, we're thinking about us and we're thinking about, uh, you know, bringing them into a community. So that's that plays a really big part. Brilliant. And, and I love the idea of collaboration. And I think, I don't know how it is in LA or Sydney or your other offices, but in London, it's definitely the, the spirit of collaboration is everywhere in the design industry. And that's what mm -hmm. I really appreciate about the community here. If you go to any agency, if you speak to any creative director or designer, they would mention other people, they, they, the work that they like, the, the agency that they would recommend to 
go and meet or the company they collaborate because they only do branding. So they have a great sound design agency that does only sound mm -hmm. or only digital. And, and everyone loves staying small and collaborating within as many people as possible. And I think definitely collaboration is something that brings creativity forward. So if anyone ha working on, on, on their own as a freelancer, uh, I think the first thing to do is, I think, is to collaborate with as many people collaborate, as possible. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Uh, great. So we have plenty more questions. I, I'm just trying to read them all. Um, so MJ Dave, uh, do you make sure uh, to set some time aside to create passion projects, projects that promote we back? Do. How important do yeah, you we, think this is? I, I think they, they go in waves. Uh, you know, this is where I think of when I was speaking earlier about there, there's like generation, there's waves. We have waves of this where we are really passionate about certain things and you know a couple of years ago we got really passionate about uh instagram and so we really committed time to that and that was a real place for our artists to experiment explore use their free time to to tackle small ideas and 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 it really worked because it became a, a community that we could sort of speak to and, and it's a it's become a great network for us um, you know, we also, we do it with some of our paying work, like, you know, our client work where we'll invest uh, time and money into something we believe in, uh, whether it's for a good cause or whether the creative is just too good to pass up. Um, and, and those, those opportunities are, you know, healing for our artists. I think like when you're doing a lot of production work and a lot of uh, service work that, that feels like you're, you know, fueling the, the marketing machine, you want to have this reconnection with the, the, the soul of the work and why we got into this to to connect to people and to to point our you know we think of ourselves as having a very bright light and we're able to shine that light on certain things and we want to continue to shine light on people that we believe should have that light and so we've been doing a lot with you know startups and with uh, you know uh, uh, nonprofits places that we believe could use the the support that we can provide. And we're always looking for new opportunities and new, you know, lanes to work in. So from like a, a positioning standpoint, yeah, we, we do invest in a lot of passion projects. I think a lot of them are harder to do because you have to carve out that time, uh, you know, and it's really challenging and you have to revisit old things. And we've gotten a lot better at like defining, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to spend. They treat it like a job. It's, the more we treat them as jobs, we're like, oh, I know how to do that. So once we we treat it that way and know our set our expectations in that sense, so then we're able to produce something in a timely fashion that's responsible, but also super inspirational and and is that does that work for us both from like a marketing standpoint, I guess, and also you know internally a feel good standpoint. Brilliant! That's such a fantastic advice about treating your passion projects like real projects and a job. Because I, definitely the biggest risk is passion projects that they never finish because you're so passionate mm -hmm. about them. Um, yeah, and, exactly. Or you never find time for them because they're not as important as your client work. So I think treating them as another project is definitely great advice. And you have the whole section on your website dedicated to research and kind of interesting things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So how do you, like, what's the structure around that? Is it you constantly have one on and the certain teams working on them? Is it that everyone, I don't know, the old Google structure of, was it one fifth of the time or mm. something you should dedicate to a passion project? What's the official yeah. structure? There, There's not quite yet an official structure and we're working on that because we do believe that it's a big part, you know, of like the creative process. So we're constantly looking for that. The, what, the, reason, the way we think of it now, and I think it's working to a point, is that we're creating these platforms for people, these playgrounds for people to experiment. And that's what that research section really represents for us. It's like, one, it's a place for us to, to think about becoming you know, thought leaders in technology while also giving a little back end into process or tools. It's really thinking of a place to showcase a lot of that in our new website. It's really thinking about, you know, what, we're, what, what we're doing kind of not what we did. And so the research is just another extension of that where it provides people a place to show what we're up to, what we're doing. And we're, we're coming up with practices to do different kinds of sprints and, and test ideas and, and make sure that we're able to track it and, and uh, keep a log of it. And then we think that that, 
that log of it ladders up to this concept of research. And that's what the research page is going to become as a place to sort of see where ongoing work is going. Like we're working on games and we're learning a lot about gaming and, and how that process is. It's very different than our other one, but it's not at the same time. Everything's kind of the same in the long run. So, you know, th we'll be, you know, keep a lookout. We'll be showing a lot of our research and development there for that. So. Oh, fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. I think your passion project, I was just looking into a couple of them recently and it's just the, the amount of craftsmanship and engineering and, and just lots of extra skills that I'm not sure if it's something that everyone has in your team or they have to learn on the go to actually put it together. That's incredible. And it's just, it, it's something that, uh, again, pushes you as a, as a studio and as a creative team definitely further than than anyone so yeah that's that's, that, that's it, it that, that sort of really speaks to our our goal of of mashing lots of different brains together that really specialize in different things and seeing what comes out of it you know not there are many 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 people that cannot code at all in our company but yet we have people that can do it really well so when you pair up a really amazing illustrator or designer with a coder and then you also have a ux designer and a uh you know, a creative director and a, a brand strategist, you've got the ripe team to build a game, you know? So it's really about pairing these little teams together that, uh, you know, and then they evolve. So this was, we're working on a hyper casual kind of game, like a, just a very simple, you know, not, not complex, but really fun and engaging. And the team has sort of, you know, it, we're treating it like a real job. The team has rolled and different members have joined and gone away and, it's evolved, it's taken pivots, it's done everything you'd imagine a game would, uh, but it's purely a passion project that way, and, but yet we're learning so much. So it's really an opportunity for us also to learn. And, you know, whenever I dive into new territories, whether it be, you know, branding or into new technology, I always find that it's about learning a language. It's a, it's not a, I'm not learning how to think, I'm not, I'm not learning how to create in that space. I'm learning how to use the vocabulary of that space because uh, the vocabulary in AR is very different than the vocabulary in, say, CG or uh, live action or branding. So you just have to learn the, the terminology. And once you have the language, you feel like you have control over your ability to communicate. Uh, and so for us, it's about, you know, so some of our old, oldest creative directors have been there the longest are working on some of these new projects. And it's really an avenue for them to learn a new language. It's like learning, you know, Spanish or or you know, Chinese or Japanese at this point in your life. It's really hard to learn a new language now, but it, in doing so, you're able to communicate more fluently, literally. Yeah. Uh, I love the idea of constantly learning the new skills. And we actually have a question from uh, Ali Q. Uh, how and where do you start learning AR, MR? And in, in general, I want to extend this question. Uh, how do you, where do you start, when you want to learn something, where do you go to learn something completely new? Uh, me personally, uh, I go to my trusted friend YouTube, but, uh, you know, because I, I recently got really into, like, as the more I've gotten removed from actually creating work on the box, I've gotten really into music. And so I've, you know, gone into modular synthesis and taught myself how to, you know, use modular, you know, music and devices and so it, and then in doing so I realized that it's very similar to when I'd be like compositing or or lighting in in 3D like node trees and you know ins and outs and you know you know layering textures on top of something to let some sound out it's all very uh simple to me because of my prior understanding of a different whole different medium I think you can start to make those connections and it's always funny whenever I'm um, chatting with some of my friends, you know, I think that's the next place I've been, uh, just to answer the question more specifically, is, is my friends and my coworkers and the people who are specialists. I think we love to think of ourselves as we, we're not information hoarders, we like to give. And I think that's one of the beauty of our studios that, you know, we people come to work every day and they just like constantly give and rarely ever take. And it's that feeling of uh, giving knowledge that lets you feel like we can get to somewhere else better in the future. So you're kind of investing by giving, you're investing your knowledge into someone else so that down the road, you can make something together beautifully. Um, but, you know, I would lean to my friends uh, who would teach me about AR real time sort of engines and how they work and what they're, what they're, 
strengths and weaknesses are, what's possible, what's not possible. They would do it in my language. So they'd speak my language and I would make connections of like, oh, that's like a pre-comp and after effects, or that's like a, you know, a displacement map and over here. It's like you, you look about the technology that you're familiar with and try to project it onto the stuff that's unfamiliar. And in doing so, you, you can find a place that's somewhere in the middle that it like attaches to your mental map in a way that feels like it's grounded in something. Great, brilliant. And, and I actually, I love your advice about just going on YouTube and asking friends. And, and I, I, I always recommend people to start with what is accessible to them right there, right now, whether they know someone or Googling things. There are so many articles, tutorials, so much free stuff online that you can mm -hmm. just go and try something. And I think the, the quicker you get into doing things, uh, the, mm -hmm. the faster you learn, even if, if it's a tiny thing, if you just opening a new software and just playing around, the quicker you get to doing, I, I suppose the learning goes uh, up from there. Yeah, it's, I always think it's about like curiosity. And it's like, if, if you're curious in something, you're going to read about it. If you like doing it, like in school, I was a decent student. But when I was really passionate about the subject matter, I would do it really well. And I would really master it. And I think identifying those things that you love and that you're interested in that like pique your curiosity those are the things that you should really kind of pursue because that's where you want to be. You want to be doing the stuff that you love to do. Great. Definitely. Passion drives everything and curiosity mm -hmm. is something that we all need to train in our heads. We have uh, lots more questions. Let's try to answer a couple more. Um, how is the integration of box offices? How to manage projects between headquarters is the question from PhD. Paula, and I, can I last? top up? Uh, a co so how is how integration between global offices and uh, kind of how do you manage projects between the headquarters? And if I can top up uh, that question with, in general, the structure of, of your teams and kind of the offices, because I, I think that was the biggest mystery for me as well, that you have lots of different mm -hmm. departments, they're kind of across different sections. So if you could talk about structure mm -hmm. a bit more. Sure, yeah, structure. Um, I would say the last few years, we really started to think of ourselves as a global company. We used to just be like the New York office and the Sydney office and the Los Angeles office that shared a pipeline and, you know, a, you know, members of the creative team that have been working together for a long time. Um, but, you know, I'd say about five years ago, we really started to make that transition to being a global company. And that just means there's a little bit more of a layer of infrastructure involved. Uh, we did have to sort of reorganize a little bit so that we could, it got to the point where it was too big that we couldn't really see everything. We didn't have visibility. There were too many meetings and we were trying to, to get to the bottom of how to really coexist and make use of everyone and to their fullest. And what we realized is that, you know, we were using freelancers to do stuff uh, out of one office that another member of the office in another, you know, so say LA has a project and they, you know, needed a, a, a really talented person to come work on it. And so they hired a freelancer. They kind of worked out of the New York office, but the person that was working on staff was looking at me. I'm not doing anything. Why am I not working on that? So that really like threw a re big red flag for us where we had to like think about the way we resource a lot differently. And it sparked this motivation, like a, a bunch of our more organized teams, like our CG department, uh, you know, a lot of our founding members came from like a film pipeline. So there is, there's always been a, a degree of structure there that's, that's, you know, very, very present in everything that they do. And it's very organized in that sense, or it can be. Um, and, there is something about that that we've taken some learning from. And so we've reorganized a bit into departments and we like to think of them as, as membranes, not silos. I think that's the fear of doing something like that, where you're so specific about what you're supposed to be doing here at Buck. And that could really uh, make you feel like, I'm not going to do that. That's not my job. And so we really want this idea of being inclusive for everybody and you know, everyone having an opportunity to do what they're passionate about. But we do feel like there's like a, we think of it like a homeroom. It's like a place you come back to in the morning every day to check in on people. And this culture, this climate we're in right now, it's been really important. We, you know, we always thought it was a little premature to have departments in New York specifically, because we're not enormous. Um, but what we, we have noticed is it's really a great way for us to connect and really talk about our discipline and our passions and 
show reference that's relevant to us. So, you know, uh, I, you know, Thomas and I are the heads of the design department in New York, and we also, you know, and in our other, along with our other responsibilities. But it's really been fun to to build this uh, collaboration and sort of community around a single discipline. And so what we do then is that we have a very good visibility of what our department is working on, what and what their goals are, and what they're committed to, and the kinds of jobs they have been great on, the, the kinds of jobs they've struggled on, and also the kinds of jobs they want to be working on. And so we would find out that like, oh, this person really likes AR, but they've always been an illustrator and a storyboard artist. So you just find these weird connections and we're able to draw those mental maps. But then when we are at our in our sort of leadership meetings and resourcing meetings, we're, we're trying to include everyone. And so by having a few people who have all the information about what their departments are doing, we're able to do some trading and we're able to say, oh, they need that. They need someone to do this kind of creative. All right, why don't we send them this guy and then we can take her and we can move her over here. So we're constantly shuffling and juggling team members to best suit the creative ask. And, you know, to being, you know, very uh, overly committed to this idea of being global has proven to be a struggle but I think that commitment is only making us uh, organize in a way that feels natural and feels like it's in our artist's best interest, not the the top line. It's really about making sure that our artists feel supported and they have, uh, you know, meaningful connections with collaborators, and they're also able to collaborate across offices in a holistic way. Great, brilliant, and I think that's it's a, such a difficult job uh, for any creative company to to organize its structure, to make sure it's, as you said, it's not silent, but at the same time, there is a good structure around the process and the project. And especially when you start becoming global, it becoming even more complicated. Yeah. So uh, well, well done to, for figuring out, I think, this situation. Thank you. Think it's a is... work in progress, but we're trying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really good. I think we have uh, kind of, we are running out of time, but a last couple of last questions. And one of them I think is quite interesting. So, um, Nelly seriously is asking, how do you overcome fear of critics? Oh, I don't look. Yeah, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I've, I'm notorious. Like, you know, my wife is an ER doctor and, and she's, you know, been working overtime. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm removed. I'm upstate with my family and she's in the city working overtime. And I, I tried to watch the news one day and I, I had totally had a panic attack. And so I just stopped watching. You know, I, I try to keep up. I think people often are, are looking at blogs and communities and, you know, um, and, and hearing what people have to say. And I think I've always taken the point of view is just like put blinders on and focus on what you can control. I think uh, we only can control what we can. And that's where we have the ability to make changes. And so it starts internally. And so the more I find uh, I'm looking out, I'm trying to chase something and I don't want to ever feel like I'm chasing anything. I want to feel like I'm, I am moving with my own inertia and my own, you know, curiosity. So there's a, it, it takes some discipline, especially with Instagram and with all of the, the outlets just bombarding you with the temptation. But I think that the, the goal is, you know, some people do it by hating, like we've got some haters and, and some optimists. And so people, you know, a couple of people love to hate on things that are really impressive and some, some people like to to just give admiration to something it's just like a psychological dynamic i think that we all have it's a little different but for me it's about you know championing championing stuff that's really creative out there and just making sure that i'm i'm, I'm focused a, a little closer in on what i can control that's that's brilliant and i definitely i think the for creative people and for anyone, to be honest, to stay insane is is focusing on what brings you joy and what you feel passionate about is incredibly important. And uh, there always will be people who hate you, who hate your work, what you do, your life choices, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Um, but I think focusing on why you're doing things and what, what it brings to you and why you started doing them as well. I think that's exactly. What... I think the your peers, too, I think are really important in that, you know, with, with so many eyeballs all over the world, it's like having a peer group that you trust. And, you know, I always joke when we, we do this like uh, Tuesdays with leads where we, we share stuff. Like it, it was supposed to be like work in progress, but it's kind of turned into finished work where we share it with our other studios. So we all get on and we talk about the process, what went into it, some decision-making, kind of a post-mortem of sorts, uh, but we're sharing it across office. So we all have visibility because it's, 
really hard. We've got a lot. I mean, we've got like so many active jobs right now. It's really hard to keep track. And this is our way to connect and sort of share learnings. Um, but, you know, I, I can get up and talk in front of rooms of tons of people. I can talk to, you know, in boardrooms and CEOs. And, and I get the most nervous when I'm presenting my work to my peers because they're the they're who matter the most. Like their their opinion of of me is like everything. So, you know, getting up and like I, I get like butterflies going to talk in front of my closest friends about the work that I'm doing. Kind of, you know, putting it all out there. So, uh, I think like you know, defining your your good friends and the people that respect your work and respect your process are the people that you should keep, and and they're the ones that are going to give you like candid feedback and. Uh, you know, help point you in the right direction rather than scare you away from doing something because of fear of failure, you know. Definitely. Great, great answer. So we actually, unfortunately, we have to wrap up and I feel like we could talk forever and definitely you gave so much great <laughs> advice to everyone and you have so many fans who have more and more questions. So um, definitely thanks everyone for joining. I'll finish with my last question to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think there, there has been like a common thread throughout the questions that people were asking about how to get a job at Buck. So mm -hmm. <laughs> any advice for anyone who dreams about working for Buck? What should they start doing now or tomorrow or today uh, to actually get a job with your fantastic company? I think it's, you know, putting your, putting, not being scared to put your stuff out there and also to really um, show show that there's uh there, there's more to what you're doing than what it looks like uh it's what it feels like and what, how, how it makes you feel uh watching it i think now more than ever we're looking for stuff that cuts through uh the noise and maybe isn't the most technical but has a really interesting unique point of view uh you could look on you know someone's instagram that's got like uh all sorts of diverse work from all different disciplines and stop motion and claymation, but sculptures and art. And, you know, there was one, there's this one story of an artist that came on board a couple years ago. Uh, he, he came in, he was a freelancer and he was just doing some animation work, like pretty, pretty simple stuff. Uh, he thought, and he was doing a great job at it, but he was putting some stuff like after hours on Instagram, that was just like, mind bending cell and sort of weird exploratories. And, and he's like, he came in, we, we offered him a job and he came in and he's like, I don't understand. Like, I, I love the job, but I don't, why do you want me? Do you know, like, because I'm just doing like pretty basic after effects work. And we were like, well, it's actually, we pulled up his stuff and we're like, it's not the after effects we want you for. It's this, it's like, it's this brilliance that you're putting out there in the world that shows us that there's way more underneath there than what you've been asked to do. So I think we're just looking for that. We're looking for people to really put themselves out there and show that there's, they've got a strong point of view on something. Uh, it could be anything really. And at this point for us, and it's about just making sure that the, you know, there are people that look like they're committed to learning and not, and committed to trying things and committed to failing and committed to, to working as part of a really big sort of crazy team. And, and if you can handle those things, then I feel like there's definitely a spot, but I'll say like, if I were getting it, you know, and going out in the market right now, I'd have a very hard time getting a job, <laughs> but you know, the, the kids these days are so damn good. And it, but it's about, it's not just about being good. It's about being like a, a full, a full person. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Ben. And, and it's such a great advice. Definitely not about the technique, but about the thinking and passion and point of view and having, knowing what you're passionate about and showing it in your work and experiments that are beyond just uh, kind of repeating everyone else's style. Um, great mm -hmm. advice. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for joining. Thank and thanks you. everyone for, for the questions. Uh, everyone who is not joining, uh, following Buck yet, they are Buck underscore design fantastic Instagram full of great inspiration and just visual pleasure. So definitely follow. I will, I will add one thing that, you know, do follow Buck You Back. It has its own unique handle and that's been a great way for people to, you know, be heard, to raise their hand and show that they're making great stuff. So I think it's a really great uh, platform to get, you know, stuff projected out in the world, but also to get our attention. And we are looking, we're voting every week. And so it is a fun way for us to, 
I, you know, it, that, that the recruiting part of it came second. The, uh, the, the conversation was really the first thing we wanted to do with it. But I do feel like if people are thinking about it, that's a great place to start. Oh, brilliant. Uh, definitely. And Ben, do you want to share your personal Instagram to follow? I saw you doing lots of experiments there as well. I used to do more. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's uh, B dot K underscore L, uh, my initials. And then, uh, you know, I have a personal one just for my kids' photos and my dog <laughs> who was parking half this meeting. But um, that's just B Langsfeld, my, you know, B in my last name. But, you know, that's if you want to see my, my life. But uh, I think I'm going to transition into sharing sort of more of my music stuff. So I'm not really sure where I'm going to do that. I think it might be in the, the place where my visual experiments used to be. But now, you know, my, my craft is phone calls and pitch decks, so <laughs> it's very different. Uh, that, is, but... that is a craft. That is a skill. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Bye. Everyone, uh, if you just Google Ben Langsfield uh, on, on LinkedIn, Instagram, everywhere, uh, I'm sure you'll find uh, the Instagrams and the profile to um, follow. Um, my name is Ekaterina. I'm the co-founder and of Nicholine Academy. So if you want to follow me, I'm Ekaterina underscore Solomina and uh, follow Futureland Academy if you want to hear more uh, fantastic interviews with creative people like Ben and other design studios that share their inspiration processes and behind the scenes. Uh, and again, thank you, Ben. It was a pleasure. I learned a lot myself. So thank thanks for joining. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been great. Thanks to all everyone who tuned in. Stay safe out there. Bye. Cheers. Bye.